Welcome to the Filmlings Podcast. A weekly podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is week 42, Legendary Lang. That's right. Or Lang. <laughs> How would you do that in German? Oh, I I don't know. I, I have no idea. Um, probably either one is acceptable. I think most people say Lang, though, because we, uh, we speak with Anglo-Saxon tongues. Um, but yeah, we are returning to another one of the directors that we touched upon in the world tour event, and we are coming back to, um, view him in more depth. Yeah. And, uh, as we've been alluding to, we're getting up to Halloween and, uh, what could be a better precursor to our full blown Halloween episode than some German expressionism, get some darkness, get some, uh, murders and magic and, uh, have a good time. Yeah, yeah, and certainly explore um, some Western horror, hint, hint, um, before we we go into next week's topic. Um, But for as of this week, we will be talking about uh, Fritz Lang, the Master of Darkness, so dubbed by the British Film Institute. So he was born in 1890 in Vienna, so a natural-born Austrian, later a German for all of one year. Um... In Vienna, he was the son of an architect, which shows in his work, Uh, and also this will be important later. His mother was born Jewish, but converted to Catholicism later, Um, so he could be considered to have Jewish heritage. I mean, he does have Jewish heritage. Um, As a young man, after graduating college, he traveled the entire world, and we'll see some of that spring up in when we talk about destiny, Um, and he studied painting in both college and Paris. Uh, he would go on to serve in World War I for the Austrian army, after which he would, suffer from, he would suffer from shell shock, which was a common term for what we now call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we see a lot of that spring up in his treatment of uh, psychological themes. Uh, he started working as a writer and then a director at UFA, which we already talked about in the German episode. That was the very large uh, state-owned, state-controlled um, film uh, studio in Germany in the lead up to World War II. Uh, There he met in 1920 Thea von Harbaugh, who became his wife in 1922, um, but was his co-writer on everything between 1921 and 1933, which is conveniently the scope of the films that we are going to be talking about today. Uh, After his final film in Germany, The Testament of Dr. Mabuza, he fled to Paris in 1934, and we'll get into that story later on. Um, and then later he would flee all the way to Hollywood in 1936, where he worked with MGM and helped pioneer um, the film noir genre, which again will come up today in our conversation when we talk about uh, M. Um, and uh, he did, I think maybe his biggest film there was The Big Heat, uh, but there were several, certainly several uh, other ones. And then his final film is another Dr. Mabuza film, uh, the Thousand Eyes of Dr. Mabuza. That was the last film which he would direct. He would appear as himself in a, uh, Franc- a Francois Truffaut film later on, but uh, he kind of went blind during the shooting of uh, his final Dr. Mabuza film in 1960 and started wearing an eye patch over one eye, which has become kind of an iconic image for him, um, and fits with the name Master of Darkness. So as you can see, uh, it's quite the storied career and uh, quite the influential career um, in, in g- the terms of uh, genre filmmaking for Fritz Lang and especially horror and thriller and all that stuff that we're going to be talking about today. But which films are going to be talking? Are we going to be talking about in particular, Jonathan? Yeah, so we're starting off with Destiny from 1921. This is still in the silent era. Um, and it's his first international success. Uh, as you were talking about, it was co-written by Thea von Harbaugh. Harbo, Harb, something. <laughs> and then <laughs> we're jumping 10 years later with uh, his first sound film in M uh, from 1931. And that's also written by Thea Van Harbaugh. And finally, The Testament of Dr. Mabuse from 1933. Um, the second of three Mabuse films, and we'll talk about that. There's are based on a kind of... Uh, serialized uh, set of books around this character, Dr. Mabuse, by a man named Norbert Jacques, and uh, is the last film co-written by Thea von Harbaugh. And that one was uh, actually banned by the Nazis. And so we get into 
Um, obviously, a lot of tensions leading up to World War II uh, once again today. And, you know, that all goes into this very uh, dark and foreboding theme that runs throughout these films, but is kind of uh, just os osmosized from the surrounding culture and the post-World War I environment. Right, right. So let's start uh, digging into our first film this week, Destiny from 1921. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to set that one up for us? Yeah, Destiny is um, basically a fairy tale. And we get so many uh, fairy tales from Germany that it makes sense that that would start to leak into their film culture. And basically, uh, we start off with a couple, a betrothed couple, and death comes along personified and uh, whisks the, uh, the man away. Uh, he dies, his time has come, but his fiance is completely distraught and she decides to try and commit suicide uh, with some potion from this guy that she ends up meeting. And so she runs into death. She makes it into his uh, little walled uh, realm, I guess. And uh, he's like, your time isn't up yet. Your time is, hasn't come. And she's like, okay, but I read that love conquers death. So maybe I can, you know, get my fiance back. And he has pity on her and says, okay, I'll give you three chances. There are three men who are about to die, and these are represented by candles, much as we saw in uh, uh, Macario back in our Mexico week. And so three candles that are about to go out, and he's like, I'll give you a chance to save each one of them, and if you can save even one, then I'll give you your fiancé back. So we go through these different, um, three different scenarios where she goes to uh, Italy, some some town in the Middle East and uh, then China, this kind of legendary China. And these are all very, uh, you know, fanciful portrayals of each of these locations. But she personifies one character in each of these stories. And then her fiance takes on the role of the man who's about to die. And death takes on the role of whoever is going to, uh, you know, be his downfall. And she has to try and save him each time. And I guess... This is, you know, almost 100 years old. So what are we in the spoiler spoiler safe zone? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and plus, like, it's a fairy tale. Like, I feel like most people know how fairy tales end before they even hear the fairy tale itself. So I, this I is a little different. It doesn't fall into kind of typical tropey, um, you know, Americanized happily ever after fairy tale realm. This is definitely coming out of Brothers Grimm kind of realm where things aren't always as uh you know neatly tied up as we're used to nowadays because she doesn't save him any of the time she she <laughs> three strikes and uh you're out kind of a thing but she wasn't totally out because death gives her one more chance and he says if you can give me a life that is not yet out someone who's still alive and they're willing to give up their life uh i will trade you basically for your fiance and she goes around and tries to find someone who will give up their life um, and eventually gives herself up. And then death does unite them. And it's kind of up for interpretation whether he unites them in the living realm or uh, in the realm of death. So it's a uh, I'm going to say very they're mystical. Both dead. Yeah, I mean, you could kind of go either way, but it it's probably leans more towards they're they're both dead and kind of united. Uh in the afterlife. So uh, Thea von Harbaugh actually started off her career as a novelist, and a lot of her novels would draw on um, German folklore and German fairy tales, and a lot of the films that um, she and uh, Fritz Lang would work on together uh, kind of revolved around those themes, and a lot of them were actually based off of her books um, that were in turn based off of those fairy tales. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not super surprising uh, to see all of that uh, f kind of you know the folklore, the the fanciful storytelling, uh, told in uh, in in Destiny, but you can also see that they take it around the world. It isn't just limited uh, to Germany. They go to uh, Venice and and generic um, generic Middle Eastern town number two, yeah, um, and and China, uh, which I would like to attribute to Fritz Lang's earlier travels. Um, when he when he did his globe trotting, but who can who can say for sure? Um, the most interesting 
thing I think about that is that this was a fairly low budget film for the time. So they really had to work on these small sets um, that were that were almost completely built from scratch to make it work. And they really do pull it off. Uh, and part of that is the tinting and part of that is the expressionist tones of the film, the expressionist style of the film, the very, you know, we talked about this when we talked about expressionism in uh, the World Tour episode, uh, where they, they like to not go for a realistic look, but go for, and literally an expressive look, uh, a, a look that conveys uh, whatever you want to convey and whatever means you can get it across. Um, typically fairly extreme so like painted shadows very large stairs uh, stairs everywhere uh very (laughs) exaggerated uh facial features like everybody has crazy eyebrows um yeah uh and and crazy teeth and part of that might just be the origin of like silent film style makeup which tended to be very heavy um but it was taken to the nth degree when we're looking at expressionist films and especially in destiny. And they, they make really good use of it too, to not only to uh, make the film seem more epic than it budget pro- than its budget probably allowed for, um, but also to kind of distinguish between each like chapter of the film. So like Germany looks and feels different than uh, Italy, which looks and feels different than uh, the Middle Eastern town, which looks and feels different from uh, the, from uh, the fairyland China they go to uh, with flying carpets. Yeah, it definitely like the the production design felt so much like uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And, you know, this is writing right on the heels of that uh, in 1921, just the next year. And uh, but yeah, that is a really interesting thing is the uh, the visual effects that um Lang is able to pull off here and we'll come back to that in the text testament of Dr. Mabuse um, because they do like there's so much like experimentation and stuff going on not in the same way that uh, like the surrealists were where they were just kind of like throwing things together but using um, different ways of exposing the film and putting different pieces of film together in order to convey a story and get an effect across so like you were saying there's flying carpets and kind of magic things happening in this legendary China, uh, situation. And so he has this, um, kind of a split screen effect where he'll have them, the, the characters sitting on the magic carpet, uh, which then fades into a different shot on the bottom of these mountains kind of moving. And it gives the impression that the flying carpet is going over the mountains. Um, and one of the things that I was just impressed with, with all three of these films is, the very intentional way that Fritz Lang uses his editing because you can kind of see the thought process that he's using whenever he uses a lot of techniques, especially in M and the Testament of Dr. Mambuse. Um, but this one too has a very kind of, uh, structured way, even in the, in, in the plot, uh, as we were talking about where we're going from, uh, you know, Germany and then we do, we do one section and then we do another section and they're literally broken up with title cards, uh, saying that it, it starts off saying this is a fairy tale in six verses. And so it's like, this is uh verse two where we go to Italy. This is verse three or whatever. Um, so it's really interesting to see just how kind of methodical Lang is with the way that he edits and constructs his films. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just to mention a couple of the other uh, really impressive special effects in destiny. Um, one that might not seem super duper, uh, shocking to our uh, hundred years later point of view, but you know just the way that death appears and disappears, uh, he like dissolves into frame and then dissolves out of frame is is pretty impressive for 1921, and it yeah. must have been fairly different than a lot of the silent films that you saw at the time. Um, and there was and the ghosts for that matter. Yeah, yeah. There's the ghost. There's the miniature army in China, which... Um, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Which is really impressive, and I still actually don't know how they do it. They must have made just like a huge foot set, <laughs> basically. Oh, yeah. For for when the army comes out, it's definitely like, let's make a giant foot and have a bunch of people walk by it. Yeah. Um, but for the for the composite shot, where they show like a wide shot of ev- all the the normal size characters and this miniature army that the, the magician in the story um, has conjured up um, moving like, like they're actually moving within the same shot. I have no idea how they, how they did that. Maybe 
Uh, I think I actually know eight. that one. Yeah. I think they did. Um, so you exp- you shoot one part of the film and you they were basically confined to this little box at the bottom of the screen. So they would black out part of the the frame um, and shoot all the, the normal action. And then they would go back and black out the part that they already shot and then expose that bottom bottom part uh, with the whenever they're set up with the what it's going to be the miniature army. And so you're basically just rolling back over the film and exposing the part that you blacked out at first. Um, and then that way you kind of put it into put two different things in, on the same strip of film. Uh, that's how I assume that that effect would have been done in 1921. Yeah, yeah. And it, it definitely uh, leads to a very uh, unique look. Um, and and it was it was we've we've been able to dig up a lot of stuff that says that this was a very influential film to a lot of the filmmakers um, that we have already talked about and some of the ones that we t- plan on talking about, uh, like Louis Bunuel, who uh, said that he saw this film and uh, decided or knew then and there that he wanted to make uh, make movies after seeing it, and Hitchcock, who was really impressed by the special effects, uh, and Fairbanks, who actually like took the special effects and put it into his own film, The Thief of Baghdad. Um, And we already mentioned that this was his first international success, but it wasn't an international success at first. Um, And this is a story that uh, we must have told about 5,000 times on the (laughs) Filmings podcast already, um, so it shouldn't be a surprise. But this was initially a commercial and a critical flop um, until it was successfully released in some Eastern European markets, um, and then was re-released in uh, the West and America and to, to widespread uh, claim, acclaim and commercial success then. So uh, sometimes if a first-year movie doesn't succeed, try and try again. I guess you don't know when you might re-release it and it becomes a, a historic masterpiece. Yeah, just cross your fingers that you're not posthumously uh, recognized, which is yeah. great, but doesn't do anything for you while you're trying to make money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, and I, I don't know if it's a, if it's that big in this film compared to the other two films we're going to talk about today. But, uh, but something we definitely need to talk about in reference to Lang in general is his uh, criticism and analysis and observation of kind of like society and politics and the human condition in each of his films. Uh, and I think the, I mean, kind of the chapters. The individual chapters about the lovers who meet their their fates, meet their deaths. Um, you could kind of see that each uh, has a criticism of each each society, but I think the real criticism in this film comes towards the end when she's going around asking um, really old people and people who are sick and dying if they would give up their last few days uh, to save her husband. And that's a complicated and hard question to ask. Like, I don't know what I would say if I was dying and somebody was like, you can die now and it would save this other person. Um, yeah, but- it was interesting. Like, you know, I there's there's kind of two sides of it because first of all, she looks like a mad woman going up, give me your life, give me what time you have left. And <laughs> but then the everyone else is just like so immediately like you will not get one day one hour or one breath from me and it was so like you know extreme on both ends that it was really interesting um how like maybe a more nuanced approach may have asked the question a little better but uh yeah that was that was an interesting twist yeah 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 and it's not it's not a criticism of the film by any way uh by any means it's just i think a precursor of what we are going to see in his later films and what we already saw in metropolis when we talked about metropolis like that's just one big criticism front to back of how of of a way that society can be and lang being like this is this is not a good way for society to be we should we should not be like this this is bad um yeah and i think the other thing that we're going to see throughout these films is um, and then even including metropolis which comes between destiny and m is the growth of the way that uh, Lang presents his societal uh, arguments and questions and stuff. Because I remember talking about Metropolis, uh, like how straightforward the message was, where they would just literally say over and over again, the 
the difference between the mind and the hands must be the heart and like literally just spelling it out for you. And Destiny like doesn't have as big of a societal um, conclusion, but going from kind of less of a societal commentary to Metropolis, which has a very uh, straightforward commentary to M, which gets very complicated. And the Testament of Dr. Mabuse, which is almost completely implied, is a really interesting journey to watch. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely an interesting growth of a filmmaker. Um, and again, we managed to seem, we seem to have managed to cut out a very precise chunk of Lang's career here. Um, everything in the between his his start of his collaboration with Von Harbaugh to um, to his uh, fleeing of Nazi Germany uh, kind of create that kind of defines an era of his filmmaking, which is really interesting to examine and look at. Um, as he as he brings out these very dark tones and these these dark themes to these this uh, basically genre filmmaking that you're looking at looking at because this isn't this isn't like this isn't mainstream stuff this isn't uh, the the dramas and the comedies that you that you would go see at your main theater these are the these are B movies essentially yeah they're they're not the uh, like we've talked about with surrealists and other things these where the state is making very kind of cut and dry, you know, classical literature remakes and stuff like this. These are the new things, the things that kind of have to be made under the gun, like we talked about with a very low budget and you're kind of having to do what you can to get it made, which makes very stylistic um, choices that then go on to influence cinema for a hundred years. All right, Jonathan, let's talk about our second film uh, with some child murder. Uh, M <laughs> from 1931 is about a child murderer. So just brace yourself for that. It's Fritz Lang. He is, uh, I mean, I think we kicked off the podcast by saying he was called the master of darkness and he's not called the master of darkness for nothing. Um, uh, and this is, first of all, it's a really, really good film. I, I, I saw it when I was younger and I didn't quite get it. Um, mostly because I watched it without subtitles in a German class. <laughs> yeah, that, so, that makes so it difficult. That was, that was a big stumbling block. Um, but eventually I rewatched it with subtitles uh, for the podcast this week. And I was like, wow, this is good, especially when I know what they're saying. Um, and this is this is a story about a child murderer who is terrorizing a town in Germany. And multiple kids have gone missing and then are found dead. And the child murderer uh, sends a letter to the police um asking asking them to take him seriously so like he straight up looks like a serial killer like out of um criminal minds or something at this point um influences influences people <laughs> um and and it, it starts to take a serious effect on the psychological well-being of the town obviously like parents are afraid for the children uh children are probably not as afraid as they should be over the course of the film like they should be more scared than they really are. Uh, but we also, also, every man becomes a suspect, yeah, basically, every, is what happens. Yeah, yeah. Everyone starts suspecting everyone of being the child murderer because no one has any idea who it could be. And it could be any of them, uh, which Yeah, and they make it up to be commentary. a big deal. Yeah, yeah, they make that up to be a big deal. It could be anyone, your neighbor, your friends, whoever. Yeah, yeah. What happens when you can't trust anybody around you for sure? Um, I think the monsters are due on Maple Street from the Twilight Zone. I was thinking, I was thinking uh, the the thing from John Carpenter, uh, where they don't know which one has become the thing. Anyway, references, guys, references. <laughs> um, yeah. So of course the cops react as well, and they're having a very hard time trying to track this guy down. Um, it's hinted at that they're incompetent, but also it's it's a really hard job. And, and the, the main uh, police captain who we follow uh, seems to be doing his best, I guess, but they're not really getting anywhere. And, of course, we also focus in on a group of criminals who aren't really given much of a name. They kind of a, a leader who we follow, but we don't, we don't focus on, on any one character too much over the course of the film. We kind of focus in on these groups. And, of course, the killer, played by Peter Lorre, um, who is iconic in this role, and we'll we'll talk about that. Um, but the criminals decide that uh, 
uh, crime is a business. It's for making money, not just for some dude to go around killing uh, on his whim. Children. Yeah. Killing children on his whim. And uh, the fact that uh, there's a child murderer out there has the police cracking down on everything. They're raiding all of the underground bars and taverns. And uh, I don't want to call it a speakeasy because I think speakeasies are only in America. I think there was a brothel. Yeah. Yeah, it might have been a brothel. Who knows? Um, but the criminals are upset about that. And they figured that the one way to stop it is to uh, find and kill the murderer. So they have they recruit the all of the homeless within the city, the ones that no one suspects, that no one even sees or pays attention to, and uh, pays them all to watch for the murderer. Um, and they eventually find him, and then chaos ensues, just absolute chaos, and it's a whole mess, and everyone's a bumbling, incompetent idiot about it, and bad things happen, and society's law and order breaks down, and law's taken into the wrong hands, and all sorts of mess and i don't want to spoil the ending because go you should go watch the film it's enjoyable to see what what happens at the end and it'll leave you i don't want to say satisfied but it'll leave you questioning and if you if you like a movie that leaves you questioning you'll really enjoy m because you kind of just have to sit back and go huh yeah it gives you a lot to think about and uh yeah like that climactic um scene there's a climactic monologue that is just really memorable and really like you know it makes you you know consider things like criminal justice and you know the way that we handle criminals and and uh you know the difference between um i guess (laughs) street law and uh the the right law is all kind of mixed up into this uh big mess and it's really interesting to watch it unfold and how like like you were saying there's not a lot of individuals uh singled out in this film it's a lot of analyzing mob mentalities and stuff like that yeah it's kind of like watching society in a petri dish um and somebody drops a child murderer into it and (laughs) says what happens like like just ask that question like what happens uh like a weird kind of science experiment on society um, of course, with really dark tones, because this is a genre film, this is a thriller film. Um, this is, I mean, this is often credited as helping to launch uh, the, helping to build the thriller genre and bring it um, into, I guess, more prominence. I don't want to say the mainstream because I want to be the mainstream again for another two decades or something like that. Um, but it also helped build the film noir genre. I mean, this is. This is a dark mystery where we don't know who the killer is. There's lots of shadows. And uh, we might have talked about it in our Expressionist uh, episode during the world tour, but uh, Expressionism has a huge impact on uh, film noir. And like I mentioned at the start of this podcast, uh, Fritz Lang plays a big part in uh, the, the film noir genre in Hollywood once he gets to Hollywood. Um, and if you think about it, like the dramatic shadows, the black and white, the kind of like the over the top, um, characters that you see in expressionism carry over into film noir in a big way. I mean, what do you picture when you think of film noir? You think of a hard boiled, uh, detective that's maybe a little over the top hard boiled. Um, and you think of black and white film and you think of, at least I always think of, um, the silhouettes with the, um, the, the slatted lines from blinds. I always think oh, of that yeah. sitting in an office. You know, that's an exaggerated shadow that carries over from expressionism into film noir. Yeah, and it's interesting seeing in this film how uh, film technology has uh, already started to um, evolve a little bit. So, I mean, obviously this is the first film uh, that Fritz Lang created with sound, which we'll talk about in a second. But also seeing the evolution from expressionist, like literally having to paint their shadows onto their sets and stuff, because you just have to flood your sets with so much light for the cameras to even pick it up that you have to manually add your shadows in as opposed to crafting the light that now in M, we actually can use more studio setup and we can put um, more natural shadows and stuff. And so seeing that um, that look come about that's much more noir and less um 
you know, artificially created, but still has the same flavor as expressionism uh, was really interesting. And there are so many moments of Peter Lorre, like h- hiding in the shadows and you're just seeing like his little bug eyes and stuff while he's <laughs> in there yeah. with all these crates and stuff like that. Gosh, um, I love the idea of a manual shadow. <laughs> like, yeah. like just that term. It makes me think of, for some reason, um, a can shadow, like a shadow in a can. Um, yeah, of just, course, technically, if you want to think about it, all cans have shadows in them. So that's true. In, until you and open yeah, them. Yeah, a, and then a then shadow in a can is just a, a can of black paint, basically. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Branding. It's all about branding. Um, yeah, but Peter Lorre. Let's talk about Peter Lorre um, because he is iconic. Whether or not you know he's iconic or you know even his face, which you probably do, because it's pretty distinctive. Um, you know, and his just to voice. bring up, we talked about him in the Frank Capra episode of all of all things with uh, Arsenic and Old Lace, where he played uh, Jonathan's little sidekick, Igor, basically. Um, so that was well into his American career, where he's probably most well known in uh, Casablanca. He makes an appearance. Um but yeah, this is going way back to his roots. Yeah, and of course, I mean, I always think of him because uh, I was kind of introduced to him through um, uh, Mel Blanc, uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons, where Mel Blanc would do an impression of him, uh, especially the one called Hair Raising Hair, where he played um, kind of an evil uh, scientist who was kind of playing into the role of uh, a Dr. Frankenstein type, creating a monster, but definitely look acted and sounded like uh peter laurie yeah and he does great in this film i mean he's playing such a dark but also conflicted character like we get way into his psyche um in this film and like how you know on good days he knows that he shouldn't do this and when he reads it in the newspaper he's like oh this is so terrible but then he just can't help himself and that's kind of his argument but he he's able to bring all of that because he has such a distinctive and interesting look that he he's definitely both um creepy and sympathetic at the same time just without even saying a word and it's so and then the his performance is able to bring both of those sides uh together in just the most perfect unison yeah yeah i mean he was able to take a very distinctive look and distinctive voice and turn it into a spectacular career um he always reminds me of uh of steve buscemi um buscemi like doesn't, early yeah yeah buscemi doesn't have the same voice although he has a very unique way of speaking um he has very unique eyes much like peter Lorre, that kind of bug out a bit and he, he's yeah. been able to kind of like um, lean into that turn and make it make it into a thing, make it into his signature, make it into his career, which is pretty great. Um, and of course, you know, Peter Lorre's uh, performance is amazing. The per- the presentation, the uh, the directing around Peter Lorre's character is also amazing. Uh, you know, for the first part of the film, we don't we don't even see him. We just hear him and see his shadow, which is a spectacular way to. Um, create a villain much like uh the shark in jaws um sometimes it's much better to not see the evil thing than to see him you just see the effects you see the families that were torn apart you see the spaces where the children used to play and now they're not um and you see the fear and the terror in the people and you just see the shadow and you know the shadow is causing it um and that's super, super scary. Uh, that's a great way to do it. And it's not because, and you know, in Peter Lorre's favor, it's not because he was a malfunctioning mechanical robot shark. Um, <laughs> he was just, he was just a really great bad guy. Um, but speaking of the shark from Jaws, one thing we have not brought up before on the podcast, but we should talk about in regard to sound design is the idea of a light motif, um, which is spelled a little word, a, a little weird. It's uh, it's the ger- it comes from uh, German filmmaking. It's spelled L I. <laughs> it's spelled L E I T motif, all one word, um, not light motif like we spell it in English. But it's it's this idea that a character or an object is associated with a musical theme, um, and not like a super heavy, not like a full blown score, 
but like a signature like beat a a, a tone <laughs> i'm not very musical inclined so obviously as you're saying i'm having a hard time explaining this but uh this this one was a really great example of it but before i, I tell you that uh, the one from jaws is probably the most famous one ever uh, because we all know what we hear when the shark is coming And of course, that that theme of the shark becomes so iconic and so associated with the fear and terror that you feel in regards to the shark that that creates a sense of dread and a sense of fear in the audience when you see it on screen. Um, it's essentially in the course of one film, um, and we've talked about cinematic rhetoric so many times, but teaching the audience to associate the, the audio cue with all the baggage that is attached with the visual cue that goes with the audio cue. So all the fear and terror and stuff that is associated with the shark is now associated with, um, with the light motif, with the audio cue. Um, and of course in M there's a very, very great one where Peter Lorre, uh, whistles to himself, the hall of the mountain King. And he whistles it whenever he feels the impulse to kill a child, whenever he sees a child, typically a little girl, which makes it worse, of course. Um, not that it actually is worse, but it's perceived as worse on screen. I, I don't know. Yeah, whether that's the fact that censorship wouldn't let him go darker or that he just wanted to kind of leave it vague. It's kind of, yeah, the fact that he only preys on young girls is just like has so much just unnervous unnervingness wrapped up in it yeah 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 and it almost it, it, this is a really weird thought but it almost makes sense to us as a modern audience in a world that's full of things like silence in the of the lambs and dexter and uh criminal minds that like a serial killer has a type and we just kind of assume it like i feel like anybody who's been exposed to that kind of uh, pop culture just knows that about serial killers I don't even know if it's true. It's just film serial killer culture, I guess. Um, but anyway, that the the light motif used around uh, Peter Lorre makes his uh, makes him kind of like the shark in Jaws. You hear it coming, and you get scared. You're like, "Oh no, this is going to be bad." Yeah, and it becomes a big plot point later on. Um, so another thing that's used in this film is. Um, a pretty simple and basic technique of overlapping dialogue. But this is something that kind of helps to cover up the fact that these films, I think all three of these films come out before the invention of sync sound. So pretty much that, that just means filming your audio and your video at the same time and being able to actually get the audio that's happening on set. Whereas at this point, the cameras are so loud and so, uh, massive and the audio technology hasn't caught up enough that you basically have to record all your audio in post. So it, doing overlapping dialogue helps to kind of cut between people who are talking and kind of cover up little mismatches and uh, and stuff like that. And this is a pretty early uh, example of just a really uh, basic sound and editing technique. You know, we've been talking about how Fritz Lang has been influencing other genres um and I don't think this is one that he gets credited for. I don't think it's one that he should get a lot of credit for. But you do see notes of it in this one is the idea of a, of a dark comedy. Because this is a really dark movie. But there are points that are kind of funny. Um, and one of them is watching some of this chaos in, uh, unfold in the in the society as a kind of as the sense of law and order and the sense of what people should be doing and the roles they should be fulfilling within the society break down as you see uh this meeting of the cops on the one hand and this meeting of the criminals on the other hand as the criminals decide that they have to find this guy um and and you see this these two uh uh, conversations ju juxtaposed and you see uh kind of just the whole incompetence of the situ situation yeah, and this moment is also one of the really uh, interesting editing techniques that uh, Fritz Lang does here, where it's almost like 
um, watching a Russian film and seeing those, uh, an old Russian film, seeing those kind of editing techniques that they've been theorizing for so long kind of come into play where Fritz Lang is literally taking two conversations that are almost going on the same track. Uh, one from the criminals saying, okay, the police are interrupting all our business. We have to track down and find uh, this child murderer. And the police are saying, okay, well, all the things that we're doing aren't working. How do we track down and find this child murderer? But these conversations are being intercut and like almost to the point where a couple times sentences will be started by the criminals or the police and finished on the other side of the conversation. So they're having almost the same uh, talk, but from two different angles. And he literally just combines them together so that there is no way the audience can mistake the fact that these are, um, you know, that he's almost equating the, uh, the criminals and the police saying that, they're just as bad as each other or they're just as useful in catching the bad guy, however you want to look at it. And another interesting editing technique is uh, at some point the criminals have ravished this building. Uh, I think it was actually a bank looking for Peter Lorre's character um, and got him out just before the police got there. So the police make a report and the commissioner, whoever is reading it, and as he's reading all the damage and destruction that was done in the building – we're seeing overlays of, you know, a destroyed um, attic space or a uh, busted up floor where they tried to get into a room from the ceiling and all these things. And then as you're talking about, one of the comedic elements is that all this destruction and that the police don't know what the criminals were doing in there. They just know something bad must have been up. But they see the uh, the safes and they're completely untouched. Everything else in the building is completely ripped up and uh and destroyed except for the safes. So they're like, what, what were you guys doing in there? And the, uh, the one that they captured eventually cracks and tells them that they were looking for the child murder. And they're like, wait, what? That's what we're doing. So again, there's that, that kind of humorous moment in the middle of this really dark thematic film. Yeah. And just to go back, uh, to a moment, uh, for a moment to, uh, destiny. I remember in the opening, a uh, few scenes, there actually being a few comedic beats, like when the they it, so the movie Destiny opens with uh, the newly uh, married couple in a carriage with a woman and her chicken, and oh, the chicken yeah. for some reason is just really funny. <laughs> and then Death gets in the carriage with them, of course, and rides along, and it gets a little less funny. But it's you kind of think that he's after the old woman too, which is another kind of subversion of expectations moment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fritz Lang is great at psych outs. I mean, he's great at uh, uh, portraying mixed up psychology, as we're about to see in Dr. Mabuza, which I still don't fully understand. I need to watch which that is again. Kind of the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and quick disclaimer just before we move on uh, the Hall of the Mountain King has been playing in my head over and over since we started this podcast, <laughs> and it probably will for a few hours after. So, um, uh, there you go. There you go. Just uh, just play that while you listen to this podcast. All right. But going from a uh, a very dark film kind of grounded in reality to a almost mystically dark film, let's talk about The Testament of Dr. Mabuse from 1933. So The Testament of Dr. Mabuse, uh, as we said, is the second of three Mabuse films that Fritz Lang made. There are a couple others that were made uh, separate from Lang, but his are definitely the most famous. Um, and I don't think that they rely on each other. I think that they're kind of like independent of each other. Mabuse is just this, uh, this kind of outlier character who can be put in any kind of situation. Um, and he, he kind of comes in very like only in very specific moments in this film. Uh, and basically what it is, is there's this, uh, ring of crime happening that's all connected and the police get alerted to it and so they're trying to figure out who's behind this and we're seeing uh from both sides the criminals who are all reporting to this boss this quote man behind the curtain and it's actually not even quote man behind the curtain because he's literally a man behind the curtain there's a curtain almost like wizard of oz like um and so we're seeing we're trying to uh follow this mystery between between the criminals and who is uh, basically directing them. And then also the police trying to figure out what's going on and how all of these different uh, crime acts are related. 
And at the same time, there's kind of a third thread where uh, the guy who tipped off the police got, went insane from this very sudden and horrific shock that happened to him. And we follow this psychology professor who uh, t- who is teaching his class about uh, a Dr. Mambuze who also had this very sudden shock that drove him insane. And he was in an insane asylum. And eventually Mambuze dies, but then he also possesses the professor who was talking about this psycholo- psychology things. And, uh, of course, Mobuze is the mastermind behind all of this crime, but in a kind of weird telepathic way. And it just all culminates at the end, of course, but it's a very uh, mystical and twisted plot to get there. Yeah, I would say that I can follow each individual story fairly well, but as to how they all connect together, I'm still a bit loose on Um just because it's it's a very complicated film, but it's good. It's so good. You don't yeah. mind that you don't completely understand what's going on over the course of the film because you're you're so wrapped up into what's going on with each of these characters. Um, I mean, just from like a writing aspect and an acting aspect, they they do a good job of telling you who you're supposed to like and root for and who you're not supposed to like and root against. Yeah, and it's almost like it felt very much like a classic monster movie in the sense that Mabuse is in there a little bit, but it's mostly the dread of Mabuse and the, the effects of what he's, um, is commanding, I guess, um, that, that we're following. But the moments that we do see Mabuse, uh, where he's kind of this, um, for lack of a better term, this like force ghost kind of a, creature is really kind of terrifying (laughs) that's a pretty that's a great description yeah i don't know how else to say it but hopefully that gives a picture in your mind at least except definitely the dark side yeah and yeah i mean that i mean i we mentioned it a little bit when we were talking about light motifs a minute ago but uh but a principal horror tenet is the less you see the monster the scarier it is and fritz lang was a pioneer in the genre of horror and um here's that tenant being put to the te- being put to the use again we we don't see him often and when we see him he doesn't really speak i mean i think he might have a couple lines towards the end he does yeah he does a really weird and creepy whispering thing whenever he's trying to influence someone like the the professor so the the times when he does speak are uh also terrifying <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but the first few times we see him, he's he's sitting in his asylum and he just looks at us like dead, yeah. like dead on into the camera with his creepy, pallid, uh, expressionist uh, makeup on that is just really, really terrifying and unsettling. And you're like, why are you looking at me? No, don't. Um, you get the sense that this is not a good thing, that he is looking at you through the camera. Um and then later on in the film, after he supposedly dies, um, you just see his force ghost thing. So he's kind of still obscured there. But even then, like his force ghost is pretty terrifying. And in really funky special effects that they that they use to achieve this, that I just don't know much about because I don't know much about special effects. Um, but they are intense. Yeah, they're really well done. And the makeup for them... Uh is still legitimately terrifying like we talked about with Nosferatu where you know some of these old movies can still have some really scary uh makeup and and uh and effects and just art direction is really good and you can't just write it off for being almost 100 years old all right so uh we should definitely talk again about sound design in this movie because Fritz Lang knew what he was doing with sound design um in in a sense you know it it does just create an atmosphere really well very good foreboding atmosphere um if you're thinking about the horror genre uh you know a sound can be three times as scary as a sight because you don't know what made the sound um a creak in a hallway you know so on and so on and also it's just good storytelling i mean half of a movie is is visual half of a movie is auditory and you you want to make full use of both and Lang definitely did. And let's talk about how he did that in this film, um, starting with just the opening shot where we see the man who 
uh, is a disgraced cop, and he's the one who's going to alert the cops eventually that uh, that Dr. Mabuza is back and is in charge of this criminal organization. Um, and he is hiding behind a trunk in some dark room somewhere that is shaking. And we don't know why it's shaking, but everything is shaking in it. And we hear this big thumping going by. Uh, I yeah, thought I at first it was a, it was a subway. Yeah, it turned plant. out to be a printing press. Yeah, that is rocking this entire, entire um, set. And it's it's kind of scary because we see this guy hiding behind... Um, behiding behind... A, a big chest and that would have been you know interesting enough but the fact that the entire room is shaking at the same time too creates that question of like why is this room shaking um but it, it also heightens the drama and heightens the the uh the sense of uh, uh the experience of the audience i think personally just because you're stimulating um the your your auditory and your visual response at the same time constantly throughout the scene um which makes it uh, a little more, uh, I guess, subjective. It helps you put in the room, helps put you in the room uh, along with the uh, the man who's hiding. Um, and of course, two thugs, two bad guys eventually come in and inspect the room and look in the exact chest uh, in which the guy's hiding behind and they even spot his foot, but they they decide to uh, let him live. They don't, d- they don't jump on him then. They uh, watch him, follow him. They follow him out afterwards and see where he's going and try to kill him later um but of course it makes for a much much different scene with the big thumping printing press along the side of it than but without it that that moment that you just talked about where they see his foot is actually kind of an allusion to um a scene that happens later because as he's hiding behind the trunk uh, his foot slips out and knocks over some bottles and stuff, but we don't hear it. All we hear is the loud thumping of the printing press, and the the thugs don't hear it either, but they do see his foot, and then they let him go. But this the idea of one main sound drowning out all the other sounds comes back into play in a pretty famous scene where uh, one of the criminals uh, is stopped at a stoplight, and he basically has a mark uh, in one of the other cars and he gets his driver to start honking and then all of the cars surrounding start honking um, and this whole stoplight is full of cars and uh, and then the criminal in the back seat shoots uh, someone in a different car but that sound is completely silent of the uh, of the gunshot and all you hear are the car horns and then when the light changes all the cars move except for one um, so it's it's two times when that that technique of one primary sound uh, almost to an exaggerated or uh, expressionist uh, extent drowning out everything um, that might give someone away in a way that uh, is is almost necessary for the plot to keep moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Expressionist is a really good word for it. Um, and not just because we're talking about Fritz Lang, but it is a... If, exaggerated over the top way to tell a story but it works it conveys exactly what you want to convey um and it also makes you really scared of car horns so be careful (laughs) the next time you're at a stoplight and you hear a bunch of people hawking um duck right uh and we should also talk about smaller uses of sound design uh for instance the psychologist over the course of the film this doctor who has been watching um uh, Dr. Mabuse and has been studying studying him for all these years. And this doctor is um, is at some point I don't know I don't know if we know the exact point in which it first starts, but he is possessed by Dr. Mabuse and is oh, used. Oh, we do know the moment because <laughs> there's a great special effects shot where Mabuse's force ghost sits down in his chair, like, um, and the uh, the faded version of him just exactly mirrors the professor and is really creepy. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. For for a while, for the first part of the movie, I thought he was, like, hypnotizing the professor through his, his weird paper scribblings that he had been doing. Um, but it turns out that he could just force ghost him. So <laughs> that works. That works. But anyway, we think the professor is in this room in his office, and uh, most of the characters think he's in his office for a large part of the film. When people come to check on him, people want to talk to him, people want to bring up that, like, hey, we think Dr. Mabuse is up to something. 
Um, can we check on, can we talk to you about it? Can we check on him? And every time anybody opens his door, you just hear him shout like, uh, didn't I tell you not to bother me? I'm busy or some, something along those lines. Every time anyone opens the door. And of course, uh, we're getting close to the end of the film and our, uh, two of our main protagonists, a reformed criminal and a, uh, and the police captain, Loman. Uh, burst down the door and they find that the door handle on the inside of the room has been hooked up to a gramophone that has been um, uh, playing a record, a recording of the doctor saying this. So he essentially fares Bueller them so that every time they try to come into the room, uh, he tells them to go away. Of course, there's no mannequin in the bed and no uh, elaborate pulley system or anything like that. But still, that's a pretty clever way to use sound design to trick not only the, the audience, but the characters within the film itself. And seeing how German Expressionism even makes its influence down to John Hughes. <laughs> yeah, no, I would actually be really curious to see if that was connected. I, it's a hard line to draw, though. That's a hard line to draw. Yeah. It's a big leap. Um, but the other thing, uh, as long as we're talking about sound, is... And we... Uh, this applies to M too, to even more of an extent, but Fritz Lang still uses silence. So these films are just getting out of the silent era and he's not afraid to just let certain scenes be completely silent. Um, there's a scene in M when they're looking for Peter Lorre and there is no sound whatsoever. Um, and there are several moments in this too. It kind of reminds me of like the opposite of what we talked about with uh, Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, where he would only use sound for certain moments and very specific moments. In this film, uh, Fritz Lang uses complete silence without doing extensive Foley work or anything uh, in order to convey his um, whatever feeling that he wants to get out. And again, like we've been talking about, I think that uh, Lang uses silence as expression expressionistly as his visuals and you know if darkness is the um you know the opposite of light in the expressionism that is the contrast then silence and sound make the contrast on the auditory side yeah yeah and i think you know lang is very good at telling a story in negative um and and what what I mean by that is that silence can mean just as much as as uh, sound. Like what you don't hear is just as meaningful as what you uh, as what you hear. Just as in the same way, seeing the uh, in the when we talked about M, when you uh, when the mother is looking for her daughter Elsa, Elsie, um, and we see we see all of the places where Elsie could have been all of the places she played with her friends and we see that they're all empty and we get she's in none of these places she should be she was killed like that that like is those shots conveying. are filled only with the sound of her name being called by her mother yeah 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 but it's it, that's a visual negative that yeah that is that is conveying the information that she's gone by showing that she's not there you're, you're telling us that she's dead, not by showing her body, but by showing where she's not. Um, and when we talk about how a lot of, uh, of building a good horror film, building a good suspense film is uh, not showing um, a monster or not showing the thing that is actually scary, letting it be off screen and letting it, um, letting it be scary in the mystery of the head and, and creating, creating mystery by introducing questions and uh, keeping that tone, then you know, being able to tell a story in negative is is a really important way to do that. Um, because those shots in M where you don't see her is, you know, we think we don't. It, it's also not a hundred percent sure. We're not like a hundred percent sure that she was killed. We just until like two scenes later when they're like, yeah, she was killed. But we were pretty sure. So we're filled with a sense of dread rather than a sense of horror in seeing her body. Um, and same thing here in the, in the use of silence, like you're, you're filled with a sense of dread rather than a sense of shock. Yeah. But going back to the origins of this film, we mentioned that it is, um, basically an adaptation from a book, from a series of books. And 
the books by Jacques were actually um, written half as novels, but with the intention of becoming films. Uh, again, this is still in the wake of Caligari and Nosferatu and all these um, German expressionist uh, horror films that became very popular uh, critically and commercially. And um, so these books were written with the intent of being turned into films, which, of course, Fritz Lang did to great success eventually. <laughs> um, but the just the character of Dr. Mabuse was a way to kind of personify the cultural um, anarchy of Germany at the time. So basically, Lang, um, through this character, could kind of put a lot of the darkness um, that he was seeing in the culture around him into one character. This Ubermensch um, is basically the... Uh, that Nietzsche's Ubermensch is kind of an inspiration for this character. And we see that especially in this film where he literally takes on metaphysical qualities in order to commit crime that could not be physically committed. Um, and it's just a, a really interesting, a different kind of German expressionist horror than the literal monster of Nosferatu um, or the very... Uh, real possible child murder from M. This is kind of a mix of the two in a kind of more spiritual sense in a, in a way. Yeah. And of course this is technically one of the first, uh, film trilogies. Um, I don't think it's the first, but it, pro probably because it's made over the course of 40 years, you know, uh, the first one, which I don't even remember what it's called is, um, is made around in the early 1920s. Uh, this one is made in the early 1930s, and the last one's made like in the 1950s or 1960. So each installment is very much relevant to uh, the the current space in which um, Fritz Lang was living. So <laughs> this is definitely a reflection of what uh, Fritz Lang and uh, Thea von Harbaugh saw in the world around them. Um, of course, Thea von Harbaugh kind of had different political views, from Fritz Lang, uh, Fritz Lang would eventually leave Germany, and Thea von Harbaugh would stay. Um, she was a really interesting character. She was uh, both an extreme German nationalist. Uh, she, I think, she did support Hitler, uh, and she would go on to uh, support the Indian independence movement and with Gandhi, which is a really interesting combination. And I don't have an explanation for that. Um, but uh, this film was the last one that Fritz Lang made in Germany. Um, it was banned by the German Film Commission, or whatever it was called at the time, um, that was headed up by Joseph Goebbels. Um, he called Fritz Lang in and was like, hey, we can't show your film, it's too subversive, but you made it really well. Do you want to be the head of UFA, which is the state-sponsored film studio, remember? Um, right which before is essentially, World War II starts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, still about uh, seven years out. Oh, yeah. But essentially, like, do you want to make propaganda for us? Do you want to uh, make Nazi propaganda? And Fritz Lang uh, says now that he knew during that conversation that he had to flee, um, flee Germany. Of course, over the next, it took him about a year after that to finally make it happen. Um, part of that was that he had to get divorced from Thea von Harbaugh over the course of uh, the process, but he did eventually flee to Paris in 1934, a year after the testament of Dr. Mabusa came out, and like I said before, moved on uh, to Hollywood in 1936. Yeah, so with that, let's kind of transfer into our overall notes um, and kind of talk about themes, because that kind of... Uh, I guess that personal overview that you just gave kind of goes into all of the themes that we've been talking about where, um, you know, in the lead up, uh, in the fallout of World War I, Germany is in basically social chaos and then leading up, uh, culminating up to World War II, you know, all of these things are going crazy. Germany is just complete turmoil at this time. And you can see that infused in all of these films, um, and the way that Lang, as we said before, like kind of progressively discusses these issues with more nuance and um, I guess more 
extremity as it goes on. Yeah, yeah, and it definitely leads to lends itself to the dark tones of uh, the genres that he liked to explore: um, horror and suspense and thriller. Um, you know, topics that relate to social chaos and um, kind of criticizing the politics of the time and criticizing just the basic nature of human beings lend itself really well. Like the the story of M, a child serial killer, <laughs> a serial killer who kills children. No, the opposite would be a very different movie. You know, that lends itself to being a horror film, to being a suspense film. And it's just a situation that is ripe for social commentary. Um, so he was very good at picking stories that were perfect for um, his filmmaking style and his own personal style of critique of the world that he saw around him, um, which all happened to be very dark. He was accused many times by many different uh, organizations that um, uh, thought he was promoting child murder <laughs> um, through through films like M, which if you've watched M, it's hard to say that that's what he was promoting. He was not. He was definitely criticizing it. Um, but he was also criticizing other aspects of society through the lens of this one situation as well. Um, so very, very dark. Yes. Um, but I don't think he was a very dark person himself. He just liked to explore the world of darkness. Um, to because that's the world he the was stories. living in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, between the two world wars, depression and social strife and, um, you know, extreme racism and nationalism all over the place. Like that's not a, yeah, that's kind of dark. Well, not just kind of dark, extremely dark. So it's, it's a good way to, uh, to, to examine the world around you. Yeah. And again, with more like of a technical look, there's, um, other things besides sound that he would use quite often, such as, uh, mirror shots. Um, so there are several in M, one is when Peter Lorre sees a mark that one of the uh, one of the vagabonds has left on his shoulder, which is a chalk mark of an M on it to identify him as the child murderer to all the other uh, criminals who are after him. And he the, the little girl that he's with that he's basically preying upon points out, hey, you have something on your shoulder. And so he looks in a shop window and he sees it in a very iconic shot is really well composed but another one that's almost more um, terrifying is whenever actually it's in the same scene when he sees that girl and he's looking in a shop window and in the shot of him, we're seeing the reflection of this mirror, uh, the frame of this mirror, which frames his face. And then in the reverse shot, we see the actual mirror, which is reflecting um, the girl that he's looking at. And it's kind of like, describing it is kind of complicated, but it's really geniusly put together the way that he frames both Peter Lorre and the girl within the frame of this mirror uh, from two different angles. And it just goes to show like what a master of camera and, um, you know, filmmaking that Fritz Lang was. Yeah. Yeah. That's some top notch shot reverse shot. And if you consider the fact that a lot of his, um, a lot of his characters seem to be exploring ideas of psychology um, and, and like the darkness inside them. And of course, you know, certainly in M, like he talks about a compulsion inside him to kill, you know, then mirror shots is a perfect way to explore that. I mean, the first shot we see of Peter Lorre's face, like we've seen a shadow, we've seen the back of him several times, but the first shot we see of his face in M is in a mirror. It's him staring at himself in a mirror. Um, oh, I forgot about that. You're right. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, mirrors are used again in uh, Dr. Mabuza. I would say both literally and figuratively. Literally, um, there's a point where uh, the captain finds a... Um, they've been trying to figure out what uh, this, this man who's gone crazy, who's been trying to tell him something, is trying to say. And he scratched something on a pane of, uh, of glass and they flip it around and they finally figure out that it says Mabuza. And uh, the there's a very long shot of the, the captain talking to somebody else, but he's, he's looking at himself in the reflection of uh, this pane of glass. This is Mabusa on it. Um, and that's just a really great kind of like showdown shot of like him versus Mabusa. Um, 
And of course, like you mentioned earlier, the first scene where Mabusa takes over um, the professors, the doctors, the psychologists, whatever you want to call them, um, take take over his mind, his body. They're sitting perfectly mirrored across from the table, each other, yeah. from each other, um, mirror uh, basically carbon copies of each other. Except one is the terrifying Doctor Mabusa, and one is some poor schmuck. But they're also kind of, like you're saying, figurative mirrors in that one is the professor trying to study and understand the the brilliance of Dr. Mabuse and how that brilliance could be used for good. And then one is Dr. Mabuse himself who used that um, that genius for evil and then that eventually takes over and then the, the, the mirror becomes one. And another technique is the... Uh, that transparency technique that they use on Mabuse, which is the same technique that he used all the way back in Destiny to show the ghosts, um, which is a pretty simple technique um, of kind of overlaying the film of a, a blank slate. So basically you shoot a field or whatever, and then you use the same film and you keep shooting the film, the, the field, and you show people walking on it, and it kind of gives them this transparency but he takes it to a whole nother level in the Testament of Dr. Mabuse, where he has this ghosted version of Mabuse pick up um, a stack of papers and hand it to the professor who is not ghosted and he grabs it. And I still don't know how they did that because it would have had to be two different shots composited. But that just the interaction between them of the professor grabbing the papers from the ghost just blows my mind. I don't know. It's probably pretty simple for someone who knows those kind of techniques, but, uh, you know, from 1933, that is really impressive. Yeah. 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 It's a shame that they weren't making, um, Blu-ray special features back then. <laughs> yeah. Behind the scenes. We, docs. Would, we would definitely know. We would definitely know now there'd be like 10 articles about it in ASC, but, uh, unfortunately we don't have that. And, uh, I talked about this in a, uh, a bit of a ramble early on, but earlier on, but uh, I do want to talk about the way that Fritz Lang creates mystery in his films, um, which is just important for almost all forms of filmmaking, um, is keeping the audience's, audience guessing, keeping the audience interested, um, and especially if you're doing anything in a genre that has any kind of mystery involved in it, which, you know, all of the genres that uh, Fritz Lang does or did, uh, rest in peace, uh, <laughs> That's very delayed. <laughs> um, His candle is out. <laughs> for like almost half a century. Um, you know, horror, thriller, proto-noir, um, actual film noir, uh, fantasy, all involve a uh, an element of mystery that is core to driving the plot and driving the interest in the film. And the mystery is in his his films are always presented in... Um, well, they're dark mysteries, but they're presented in a delightful way. Like seeing the way that uh, Pierre Laurie's identity is hidden in M through the use of just like his leitmotif, his whistling, and you just seeing the back of his head or shadow for like the first 10, 15, 20 minutes of the film is fantastic. You're like, oh my gosh, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And you know so much about him before you finally, until, before you finally see him. Um, and that makes it all the more weird and creepy when you do. Um, and of course, we have to talk about the man behind the curtain in Testament of Dr. Mabusa. Um, you know, all of the criminals are getting their orders from this man behind a curtain. And you can kind of see his silhouette. He's sitting at a desk. And at one point, um, our one of our main protagonists, a uh, reformed criminal, um, is trapped in the room with him. And they tell him, he, you're never going to get out alive. And he's like, oh, yeah. He pulls out a gun and shoots at the man behind a curtain, rips back the curtain, and it's just a cardboard cut out of the desk which is great. That is great storytelling um, because it answers a question, answers one question. It's like, who, what, who's behind the curtain? A cardboard cutout is your answer. But it raises so many more questions. You're like, oh my gosh, why is there a cardboard cutout behind the curtain? Who, how is anybody giving him orders? What's going to happen now? Um, and that's just, that's just solid storytelling. Um, and, and that's just something that Ling, what, uh, became a master of over the course of his career. And you see it make his, make his films just fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can kind of equate some of these films, um, 
to American kind of B horror movies with uh, Dracula and Frankenstein and stuff that's well regarded now as classics, but was kind of the, the lower end of the spectrum as far as films that were coming out and how they were regarded. But these are really masterful films. And regardless of how they were um, uh, received back then in um, upcoming Nazi Germany, these are uh, have such a lasting legacy. And we could see that in so many films and filmmakers who have gotten their inspiration from Fritz Lang and the directors of the German Expressionist movement. And it's, it's really amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Nazis weren't the only ones over the course of film history who poo-pooed um, genre films um, for a very long time. And I think this has changed recently, um, in, in at least I hope so, because <laughs> uh, looking around, you know, people take fil- uh, horror films like It or Get Out just as seriously as they take uh, drama films that are coming out. Um, but that wasn't the case for a lot of film history where uh, those were considered B-movies. They were considered lesser than. It wasn't where serious actors worked. It wasn't where serious artists worked. Um, and eventually, you know, the work of Fritz Lang was rehabilitated by a lot of the people in the French New Wave who wrote on him and were like, why don't those Americans uh, cherish him? He's so great. Um, just because he does genre films. Like, they're great genre films. They're still great films. And that's very true. And uh, while I don't think that's something we do to today as much, I think it's something to avoid. Just because something is a genre film doesn't mean it's it's lesser than a drama. In fact, a lot of the genre films that come out today are probably better than a lot of the dramas that come out today. So uh, there you go. Give, give genre film a chance if you haven't, and uh, give Fritz Lang's films a chance if you haven't. And speaking of genre films, um, but not American genre films, let's talk about next week, where we have a very special guest. Alex, you want to introduce our special guest? I do, because next week, our special guest is a film student and just so happens to be my sister, uh, Emily Geringer, who is going to come on the podcast and talk about uh, horror films, but not just horror films, Eastern horror films. Because we're filmlings, and that's just how we do. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't be us if we didn't go abroad at least a little bit. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be talking about some Korean and Japanese horror uh, next week on the show. Uh, our only Japanese film next week is Audition from 1999. And then we have two Korean films, uh, Juan the Grudge from 2002 and A Tale of Two Sisters from 2003. And I have been told that all three of these are absolutely horrifying. Um, and not just because they're jump scary. Uh, because they're psychologically uh, messed up and scary and terrifying, which we saw a little bit of this week with the likes of M and the Testament of Dr. Mabuza. So it'll be interesting uh, to flip from a foreign filmmaker in the West to a series of foreign filmmakers in the East. Um, And of course, I always love talking with my sister. I think you guys will too. Um, And it should be a very fun and creepy, terrifying episode that I'm a little scared to do research on. Yeah, and uh, speaking of the world tour, we're actually seeing a director from the world tour uh, in A Tale of Two Sisters, uh, Ji Woon Kim, who directed The Good, The Bad, and The Weird, um, which I have a feeling is going to be a very different tone than A Tale of Two Sisters. So that will be an interesting comparison. Yeah, talk about genre filmmaking. Right. (laughs) Well, that's about all the time we have for this episode. If you have movie suggestions for us or just want to reach out, I can be found on Twitter at at JS Satchel. And I'm at Alex Geringer. And to find links to things that we talked about today, you can view them on the blog at thefilmlinks.com. If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people know what we're all about. Seriously, do it. (laughs) We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next week. All right, see ya. Much like the Jaws in Shark, you know, sometimes it's better when you don't see it. You want to flip that around? What? You said much like the Jaws in Shark. Oh, oops. That was wrong. That is the wrong way to say that phrase.